Think and Grow Rich. Chapter 1 The man W.H.O. thought his way into partnership with Thomas A. Edison. Truly, thoughts are things, and powerful things at that, when they are mixed with definiteness of purpose, persistence, and a burning desire for their translation into riches, or other material objects. A little more than 30 years ago, Edwin C. Barnes discovered how true it is that men really do think and grow rich. His discovery did not come about at one sitting, it came little by little, beginning with a burning desire to become a business associate of the great Edison. One of the chief characteristics of Barnes' desire was that it was definite. He wanted to work with Edison, not for him. Observe, carefully, the description of how he went about translating his desire into reality and you will have a better understanding of the 13 principles which lead to riches. When this desire, or impulse of thought, first flashed into his mind he was in no position to act upon it. Two difficulties stood in his way. He did not know Mr. Edison, and he did not have enough money to pay his railroad fare to Orange, New Jersey. These difficulties were sufficient to have discouraged the majority of men from making any attempt to carry out the desire. But his was no ordinary desire. He was so determined to find a way to carry out his desire that he finally decided to travel by blind baggage, rather than be defeated to the uninitiated. This means that he went to East Orange on a freight train. He presented himself at Mr. Edison's laboratory, and announced he had come to go into business with the inventor. In speaking of the first meeting between Barnes and Edison, years later, Mr. Edison said, He stood there before me, looking like an ordinary tramp. But there was something in the expression of his face which conveyed the impression that he was determined to get what he had come after. I had learned, from years of experience with men, that when a man really desires a thing so deeply that he is willing to stake his entire future on a single turn of the wheel in order to get it, he is sure to win. I gave him the opportunity he asked for, because I saw he had made up his mind to stand by until he succeeded. Subsequent events proved that no mistake was made. Just what young Barnes said to Miss Edison on that occasion was far less important than that which he thought. Edison, himself, said so. It could not have been the young man's appearance which got him his start in the Edison office, for that was definitely against him. It was what he thought that counted. If the significance of this statement could be conveyed to every person who reads it, there would be no need for the remainder of this book. Barnes did not get his partnership with Edison on his first interview. He did get a chance to work in the Edison offices, at a very nominal wage, doing work that was unimportant to Edison, but most important to Barnes, because it gave him an opportunity to display his merchandise where his intended partner could see it. Months went by, apparently nothing happened to bring the coveted goal which Barnes had set up in his mind as his definite major purpose. But something important was happening in Barnes' mind. He was constantly intensifying his desire to become the business associate of Edison. Psychologists have correctly said that when one is truly ready for a thing, it puts in its appearance. Barnes was ready for a business association with Edison, moreover, he was determined to remain ready until he got that which he was seeking. He did not say to himself, ah well, 
What's the use? I guess I'll change my mind and try for a salesman's job. But, he did say, I came here to go into business with Edison, and I'll accomplish this and if it takes the remainder of my life. He meant it. What a different story men would have to tell if only they would adopt a definite purpose and stand by that purpose until it had time to become an all-consuming obsession. Maybe young Barnes did not know it at the time, but his bulldog determination, his persistence in standing back of a single desire, was destined to mow down all opposition, and bring him the opportunity he was seeking. When the opportunity came, it appeared in a different form, and from a different direction than Barnes had expected. That is one of the tricks of opportunity. It has a sly habit of slipping in by the back door, and often it comes disguised in the form of misfortune, or temporary defeat. Perhaps this is why so many fail to recognize opportunity. Mr. Edison had just perfected a new office device known at that time, as the Edison dictating machine, now the Ediphone. His salesmen were not enthusiastic over the machine. They did not believe it could be sold without great effort. Barnes saw his opportunity. It had crawled in quietly, hidden in a queer-looking machine which interested no one but Barnes and the inventor. Barnes knew he could sell the Edison dictating machine. He suggested this to Edison, and promptly got his chance. He did sell the machine. In fact, he sold it so successfully that Edison gave him a contract to distribute and market it all over the nation. Out of that business association grew the slogan, made by Edison and installed by Barnes. The Business Alliance has been in operation for more than 30 years. Out of it Barnes has made himself rich in money, but he has done something infinitely greater. He has proved that one really may think and grow rich. How much actual cash that original desire of Barnes has been worth to him, I have no way of knowing. Perhaps it has brought him two or three million dollars, but the amount, whatever it is, becomes insignificant when compared with the greater asset he acquired in the form of definite knowledge that an intangible impulse of thought can be transmuted into its physical counterpart by the application of known principles. Barnes literally thought himself into a partnership with the great Edison. He thought himself into a fortune. He had nothing to start with except the capacity to know what he wanted, and the determination to stand by that desire until he realized it. He had no money to begin with. He had but little education. He had no influence. But he did have initiative, faith, and the will to win. With these intangible forces he made himself number one man with the greatest inventor who ever lived. Now, let us look at a different situation, and study a man who, had plenty of tangible evidence of riches, but lost it, because he stopped three feet short of the goal he was seeking. Three feet from gold. One of the most common causes of failure is the habit of quitting when one is overtaken by temporary defeat. Every person is guilty of this mistake at one time or another. An uncle of Ayu Darby was caught by the gold fever in the gold rush days, and went west to dig and grow rich. He had never heard that more gold has been mined from the brains of men than has ever been taken from the earth. He staked a claim and went to work with pick and shovel. The going was hard but his lust for gold was definite. After weeks of labor, he was rewarded by the discovery of the shining ore. He needed machinery to bring the ore to the surface. Quietly, he covered up the mine, retraced his footsteps to his home in Williamsburg, 
Mary Land, told his relatives and a few neighbors of the strike. They got together money for the needed machinery, had it shipped. The uncle and Darby went back to work the mine. The first car of all was mined, and shipped to a smelter. The returns proved they had one of the richest mines in Colorado. A few more cars of that ore would clear the debts. Then would come the big killing in profits. Down went the drills. Up went the hopes of Darby and Dunkel. Then something happened. The vein of gold ore disappeared. They had come to the end of the rainbow and the pot of gold was no longer there. They drilled on, desperately trying to pick up the vein again all to no avail. Finally, they decided to quit. They sold the machinery to a junk man for a few hundred dollars, and took the train back home. Some junk men are dumb, but not this one. He called in a mining engineer to look at the mine and do a little calculating. The engineer advised that the project had failed, because the owners were not familiar with fault lines. His calculations showed that the vein would be found just three feet from where the Darbys had stopped drilling. That is exactly where it was found. The junk man took millions of dollars in ore from the mine, because he knew enough to seek expert counsel before giving up. Most of the money which went into the machinery was procured through the efforts of R.U. Darby, who was then a very young man. The money came from his relatives and neighbors, because of their faith in him. He paid back every dollar of it, although he was years in doing so. Long afterward, Mr. Darby recouped his loss many times over when he made the discovery that desire can be transmuted into gold. The discovery came after he went into the business of selling life insurance. Remembering that he lost a huge fortune, because he stopped three feet from gold, Darby profited by the experience in his chosen work, by the simple method of saying to himself, I stopped three feet from gold. But I will never stop because men say I know when I ask them to buy insurance. Darby is one of a small group of fewer than 50 men who sell more than a million dollars in life insurance annually. He owes his stickability to the lesson he learned from his quitability in the gold mining business. Before success comes in any man's life, he is sure to meet with much temporary defeat and, perhaps, some failure. When defeat overtakes a man, the easiest and most logical thing to do is to quit. That is exactly what the majority of men do. More than 500 of the most successful men this country has ever known, told the author their greatest success came just one step beyond the point at which defeat had overtaken them. Failure is a trickster with a keen sense of irony and cunning. It takes great delight in tripping one when success is almost within reach. A 50 cent lesson in persistence shortly after Mr. Darby received his degree from the University of Hard Knocks and had decided to profit by his experience in the gold mining business. He had the good fortune to be present on an occasion that proved to him that no does not necessarily mean number. One afternoon he was helping his uncle grind wheat in an old-fashioned mill. The uncle operated a large farm on which a number of colored share crop farmers lived. Quietly, the door was opened and a small colored child, the daughter of a tenant, walked in and took her place near the door. The uncle looked up, saw the child, and barked at her roughly, What do you want? Meekly. The child replied, My mammy say send her fifty cents, I'll not do it. The uncle retorted, Now you run on home. Yes sir, 
The child replied, but she did not move. The uncle went ahead with his work, so busily engaged that he did not pay enough attention to the child to observe that she did not leave. When he looked up and saw her still standing there, he yelled at her, I told you to go on home. Now go, or I'll take a switch to you. The little girl said yes sir, but she did not budge an inch. The uncle dropped a sack of grain he was about to pour into the mill hopper, picked up a barrel stave, and started toward the child with an expression on his face that indicated trouble. Darby held his breath. He was certain he was about to witness a murder. He knew his uncle had a fierce temper. He knew that colored children were not supposed to defy white people in that part of the country. When the uncle reached the spot where the child was standing, she quickly stepped forward one step, looked up into his eyes, and screamed at the top of her shrill voice, my mammy's got to have that fifty cents. The uncle stopped, looked at her for a minute, then slowly laid the barrel stave on the floor, put his hand in his pocket, took out half a dollar, and gave it to her. The child took the money and slowly backed toward the door, never taking her eyes off the man whom she had just conquered. After she had gone, the uncle sat down on a box and looked out the window into space for more than ten minutes. He was pondering, with awe, over the whipping he had just taken. Mr. Darby, too, was doing some thinking. That was the first time in all his experience that he had seen a colored child deliberately master an adult white person. How did she do it? What happened to his uncle that caused him to lose his fierceness and become as docile as a lamb? What strange power did this child use that made her master over her superior? These and other similar questions flashed into Darby's mind, but he did not find the answer until years later, when he told me the story. Strangely, the story of this unusual experience was told to the author in the old mill, on the very spot where the uncle took his whipping. Strangely, too, I had devoted nearly a quarter of a century to the study of the power which enabled an ignorant, illiterate colored child, to conquer an intelligent man. As we stood there in that musty old mill, Mr. Darby repeated the story of the unusual conquest, and finished by asking, what can you make of it? What strange power did that child use, that so completely whipped my uncle? The answer to his question will be found in the principles described in this book. The answer is full and complete. It contains details and instructions sufficient to enable anyone to understand, and apply the same force which the little child accidentally stumbled upon. Keep your mind alert, and you will observe exactly what strange power came to the rescue of the child. You will catch a glimpse of this power in the next chapter. Somewhere in the book you will find an idea that will quicken your receptive powers, and place at your command, for your own benefit, this same irresistible power. The awareness of this power may come to you in the first chapter, or it may flash into your mind in some subsequent chapter. It may come in the form of a single idea, or, it may come in the nature of a plan, or a purpose. Again, it may cause you to go back into your past experiences of failure or defeat, and bring to the surface some lesson by which you can regain all that you lost through defeat. After I had described to Mr. Darby the power unwittingly used by the little colored child, he quickly retraced his thirty years of experience as a life insurance salesman, and frankly acknowledged that his success in that field was due, in no small degree, 
to the lesson he had learned from the child. Mr. Darby pointed out, every time a prospect tried to bow me out, without buying, I saw that child standing there in the old mill, her big eyes glaring in defiance, and I said to myself, eh I've got to make this sale. The better portion of all sales I have made, were made after people had said I no. He recalled, too, his mistake in having stopped only three feet from gold, but, he said, that experience was a blessing in disguise. It taught me to keep on keeping on, no matter how hard the going may be, a lesson I needed to learn before I could succeed in anything. This story of Mr. Darby and his uncle, the colored child and the gold mine, doubtless will be read by hundreds of men who make their living by selling life insurance. And to all of these, the author wishes to offer the suggestion that Darby owes to these two experiences his ability to sell more than a million dollars of life insurance every year. Life is strange, and often imponderable. Both the successes and the failures have their roots in simple experiences. Mr. Darby's experiences were commonplace and simple enough yet they held the answer to his destiny in life, therefore they were as important, to him, as life itself. He profited by these two dramatic experiences, because he analyzed them, and found the lesson they taught. But what of the man who has neither the time, nor the inclination to study failure in search of knowledge that may lead to success? Where? And how is he to learn the art of converting defeat into stepping stones to opportunity? In answer to these questions, this book was written. The answer called for a description of 13 principles, but remember, as you read, the answer you may be seeking, to the questions which have caused you to ponder over the strangeness of life, may be found in your own mind through some idea, plan, or purpose which may spring into your mind as you read. One sound idea is all that one needs to achieve success. The principles described in this book, contain the best, and the most practical of all that is known, concerning ways and means of creating useful ideas. Before we go any further in our approach to the description of these principles, we believe you are entitled to receive this important suggestion of broken bar. When riches begin to come they come so quickly, in such great abundance, that one wonders where they have been hiding during all those lean years. This is an astounding statement and all the more so, when we take into consideration the popular belief, that riches come only to those who work hard and long. When you begin to think and grow rich, you will observe that riches begin with a state of mind, with definiteness of purpose, with little or no hard work. You, and every other person, ought to be interested in knowing how to acquire that state of mind which will attract riches. I spent 25 years in research, analyzing more than 25,000 people, because I, too, wanted to know how wealthy men become that way. Without that research, this book could not have been written. Here take notice of a very significant truth, viz. The business depression started in 1929, and continued on to an all-time record of destruction, until some time after President Roosevelt entered office. Then the depression began to fade into nothingness. Just as an electrician in a theater raises the light so gradually that darkness is transmuted into light before you realize it. So did the spell of fear in the minds of the people gradually fade away and become faith. Observe very closely, as soon as you master the principles of this philosophy, 
and begin to follow the instructions for applying those principles, your financial status will begin to improve, and everything you touch will begin to transmute itself into an asset for your benefit. Impossible? Not at all. One of the main weaknesses of mankind is the average man's familiarity with the word impossible. He knows all the rules which will not work. He knows all the things which cannot be done. This book was written for those who seek the rules which have made others successful, and are willing to stake everything on those rules. A great many years ago I purchased a fine dictionary. The first thing I did with it was to turn to the word impossible, and neatly clip it out of the book. That would not be an unwise thing for you to do. Success comes to those who become success conscious. Failure comes to those who indifferently allow themselves to become failure conscious. The object of this book is to help all who seek it, to learn the art of changing their minds from failure consciousness to success consciousness. Another weakness found in altogether too many people, is the habit of measuring everything, and everyone by their own impressions and beliefs. Some who will read this, will believe that no one can think and grow rich. They cannot think in terms of riches, because their thought habits have been steeped in poverty, want, misery, failure, and defeat. These unfortunate people remind me of a prominent Chinese who came to America to be educated in American ways. He attended the University of Chicago. One day President Harper met this young Oriental on the campus, stopped to chat with him for a few minutes, and asked what had impressed him as being the most noticeable characteristic of the American people. Why, the Chinaman exclaimed, the queer slant of your eyes. Your eyes are off slant. What do we say about the Chinese? We refuse to believe that which we do not understand. We foolishly believe that our own limitations are the proper measure of limitations. Sure, the other fellow's eyes are off slant, because they are not the same as our OWN. Millions of people look at the achievements of Henry Ford after he has arrived, and envy him, because of his good fortune, or luck, or genius, or whatever it is that they credit for Ford's fortune. Perhaps one person in every hundred thousand knows the secret of Ford's success, and those who do know are too modest, or too reluctant, to speak of it because of its simplicity. A single transaction will illustrate the secret perfectly. A few years back, Ford decided to produce his now famous V8 motor. He chose to build an engine with the entire eight cylinders cast in one block, and instructed his engineers to produce a design for the engine. The design was placed on paper, but the engineers agreed, to a man, that it was simply impossible to cast an eight-cylinder gas engine block in one piece. Ford said, produce it anyway. But, they replied, it's impossible. Go ahead, Ford commanded, and stay on the job until you succeed no matter how much time is required. The engineers went ahead. There was nothing else for them to do if they were to remain on the Ford staff. Six months went by, nothing happened. Another six months passed, and still nothing happened. The engineers tried every conceivable plan to carry out the orders, but the thing seemed out of the question impossible. At the end of the year Ford checked with his engineers and again they informed him they had found no way to carry out his orders. Go right ahead, said Ford, I want it, and I'll have it. They went ahead, and then, as if by a stroke of magic, the secret was discovered. 
the Ford determination had won once more. This story may not be described with minute accuracy, but the sum and substance of it is correct. Deduce from it, you who wish to think and grow rich, the secret of the Ford millions, if you can. You'll not have to look very far. Henry Ford is a success, because he understands and applies the principles of success. One of these is desire, knowing what one wants. Remember this Ford story as you read, and pick out the lines in which the secret of his stupendous achievement have been described. If you can do this, if you can lay your finger on the particular group of principles which made Henry Ford rich, you can equal his achievements in almost any calling for which you are suited. You are the master of your fate, the captain of your soul, because he broke and bar when Henley wrote the prophetic lines, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. He should have informed us that we are the masters of our fate, the captains of our souls because we have the power to control our thoughts. He should have told us that the ether in which this little earth floats, in which we move and have our being, is a form of energy moving at an inconceivably high rate of vibration, and that the ether is filled with a form of universal power which adapts itself to the nature of the thoughts we hold in our minds and influences us in natural ways, to transmute our thoughts into their physical equivalent. If the poet had told us of this great truth, we would know WHYIT is that we are the masters of our fate, the captains of our souls. He should have told us, with great emphasis, that this power makes no attempt to discriminate between destructive thoughts and constructive thoughts that it will urge us to translate into physical reality thoughts of poverty, just as quickly as it will influence us to act upon thoughts of riches. He should have told us, too, that our brains become magnetized with the dominating thoughts which we hold in our minds, and, by means with which no man is familiar, these magnets attract to us the forces, the people, the circumstances of life which harmonize with the nature of our dominating thoughts. He should have told us, that before we can accumulate riches in great abundance, we must magnetize our minds with intense desire for riches, that we must become money conscious until the desire for money drives us to create definite plans for acquiring it. But being a poet, and not a philosopher, Henley contented himself by stating a great truth in poetic form, leaving those who followed him to interpret the philosophical meaning of his lines. Little by little, the truth has unfolded itself, until it now appears certain that the principles described in this book, hold the secret of mastery over our economic fate. We are now ready to examine the first of these principles. Maintain a spirit of open-mindedness, and remember as you read, they are the invention of no one man. The principles were gathered from the life experiences of more than 500 men who actually accumulated riches in huge amounts men who began in poverty, with but little education, without influence. The principles worked for these men. You can put them to work for your own enduring benefit. You will find it easy not hard, to do. Before you read the next chapter, I want you to know that it conveys factual information which might easily change your entire financial destiny, as it has so definitely brought changes of stupendous proportions to two people described. I want you to know, also, that the relationship between these two men and myself, is such that I could have taken no liberties with the facts, 
even if I had wished to do so. One of them has been my closest personal friend for almost 25 years, the other is my own son. The unusual success of these two men, success which they generously accredit to the principle described in the next chapter, more than justifies this personal reference as a means of emphasizing the far-flung power of this principle. Almost 15 years ago, I delivered the commencement address at Salem College, Salem, West Virginia. I emphasized the principle described in the next chapter, with so much intensity that one of the members of the graduating class definitely appropriated it, and made it a part of his own philosophy. The young man is now a member of Congress and an important factor in the present administration. Just before this book went to the publisher, he wrote me a letter in which he so clearly stated his opinion of the principle outlined in the next chapter, that I have chosen to publish his letter as an introduction to that chapter. It gives you an idea of the rewards to come. My dear Napoleon, my service as a member of Congress having given me an insight into the problems of men and women, I am writing to offer a suggestion which may become helpful to thousands of worthy people. With apologies, I must state that the suggestion, if acted upon, will mean several years of labor and responsibility for you, but I am enheartened to make the suggestion because I know your great love for rendering useful service. In 1922, you delivered the commencement address at Salem College, when I was a member of the graduating class. In that address, you planted in my mind an idea which has been responsible for the opportunity I now have to serve the people of my state, and will be responsible, in a very large measure for whatever success I may have in the future. The suggestion I have in mind is, that you put into a book the sum and substance of the address you delivered at Salem College, and in that way give the people of America an opportunity to profit by your many years of experience and association with the men who, by their greatness, have made America the richest nation on earth. I recall as though it were yesterday, the marvelous description you gave of the method by which Henry Ford, with but little schooling, without a dollar, with no influential friends, rose to great heights. I made up my mind then, even before you had finished your speech, that I would make a place for myself, no matter how many difficulties I had to surmount. Thousands of young people will finish their schooling this year, and within the next few years, every one of them will be seeking just such a message of practical encouragement as the one I received from you. They will want to know where to turn, what to do, to get started in life. You can tell them, because you have helped to solve the problems of so many, many people. If there is any possible way that you can afford to render so great a service, may I offer the suggestion that you include with every book, one of your personal analysis charts, in order that the purchaser of the book may have the benefit of a complete self-inventory, indicating, as you indicated to me years ago, exactly what is standing in the way of success. Such a service as this, providing the readers of your book with the complete, unbiased picture of their faults and their virtues, would mean to them the difference between success and failure. The service would be priceless. Millions of people are now facing the problem of staging a comeback because of the depression, and I speak from personal experience when I say, I know these earnest people would welcome the opportunity to tell you their problems, 
and to receive your suggestions for the solution. You know the problems of those who face the necessity of beginning all over again. There are thousands of people in America today who would like to know how they can convert ideas into money, people who must start at scratch, without finances and recoup their losses. If anyone can help them, you can. If you publish the book, I would like to own the first copy that comes from the press, personally autographed by you. With best wishes, believe me, cordially yours, Jennings Randolph.